Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you study and teach the scriptures with more relevancy, impact, and power. And this week, we're going to be doing 2 Nephi 26 through 30. And I'm going to throw in the last half of chapter 25 as well, because I felt it went better thematically with this week's lesson. And as a reminder, if you'd like printable lesson plans based on these videos or the PowerPoint slides and handouts that I use to make them, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to my channel, the blog, and my shop. So let's go ahead and dig deep. Maybe a short joke would be a good way to get things started. Do you know the definition of a good high counselor talk? It should have a good beginning. It should have a good ending. And the two should be as close together as possible right? Ah, the poor high counselors, they get such a bad rep, don't they? Well, what about you? How do you like to give a sacrament meeting talk? Do you write everything out word for word and then read it? Do you memorize your talk? Do you use a note card with bullet points to guide you along? Or are you the kind of person that just can totally wing it and you just say whatever comes to mind in the moment? And uh, why do you do it the way that you do? Well, as I was reading the Book of Mormon one time, I came to the realization that really it's a book of talks or sermons. You, you have a couple chapters of history, and then you have a sermon, then more history, then another sermon. And it's kind of that pattern all the way throughout the Book of Mormon. And in 2 Nephi 25 through 30, Nephi is going to give a talk to his people. And uh, since I'm the type of person that likes to use a note card with bullet points, I often wonder what the prophet's note card for this talk would have looked like. And for these particular chapters, this is what I came up with. 2 Nephi 25, the Jews will reject the Savior and fall into a state of apostasy. 2 Nephi 25, 1 through 11, the Nephites and Lamanites will reject the Savior and fall into a state of apostasy. 2 Nephi 26, 12 through 33, the Gentiles will reject the Savior and fall into a state of apostasy. Then 2 Nephi 27, But in the latter days, the Lord will give the world a second chance. And I'm not going to tell you quite yet what that second chance is. We're going to see if you can figure that out on your own. But then 2 Nephi 28-29, through 29, I'd call Satan's counterattack. And then 2 Nephi 30, the final victory. And the portion that I'm not going to spend much time on is that beginning part. Nephi explains that all three groups of people, the Jews, the Nephites, and the Gentiles, are all going to fall into a state of apostasy. And we all remember the name that we give to that period of Earth's history, right? We call it the Great Apostasy. And you can see why. All three major groups are lost. And at this point in Nephi's talk, if you were there, you might throw up your hands in despair and say, but Nephi, this can't be how the story ends. Tell me there's more to this talk than doom and gloom. Isn't there any hope for the world? And to that, Nephi begins to smile a little, and he says, Yes, yes, you're right. That isn't the end of the story. And then he reminds us all of a critical truth right at the end of chapter 26. And I want you to examine 26 verses 24 through 28, and then verse 33, and be prepared to summarize in one sentence what you feel the major message of those verses is. I'll read it for you. He doeth not anything, save it be for the benefit of the world. For he loveth the world, even that he layeth down his life, that he may draw all men unto him. Wherefore he commandeth none, that they shall not partake of his salvation. Behold, doth he cry unto any, saying, Depart from me. Behold, I say unto you, Nay. But he saith, Come unto me, all ye ends of the earth. By milk and honey, without money and without price. Behold, hath he commanded any that they should depart out of the synagogues, or out of the houses of worship? Behold, I say unto you, Nay. Hath he commanded any that they should not partake of his salvation? Behold, I say unto you, Nay. But he hath given it free for all men. And he hath commanded his people that they should persuade all men to repentance. Behold, hath the Lord commanded any that they should not partake of his goodness? Behold, I say unto you, Nay, but all men are privileged the one like unto the other, and none are forbidden. For none of these iniquities come of the Lord, for he doeth that which is good among the children of men, and he doeth nothing save it be plain unto the children of men. 
and he inviteth them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. And he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, and he remembereth the heathen. And all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. So, what's the message? What one thing does Nephi want all of us to remember? Here are some possible answers you might get. All are alike unto God. The gospel is for everybody. And God invites all people to come unto him. And therefore, what? How should that truth change us? Some possible answers to that question. Racism, bigotry, discrimination, and hatred are appalling to our Father in heaven. It should be appalling to me too. Or, I can invite all people to come unto Christ. I must not exclude anyone from my missionary efforts. Or, I can strive to see all people as God sees them, as his beloved children. I love this thought from Elder Holland, who in a recent talk compared the church to a giant choir. And he said, There is room for those who speak different languages, celebrate diverse cultures, and live in a host of locations. There's room for the single, for the married, for large families, and for the childless. There is room for those who once had questions regarding their faith, and room for those who still do. There's room for those with differing sexual attractions. In short, there is a place for everyone who loves God and honors His commandments as the inviolable measuring rod for personal behavior. For if love of God is the melody of our shared song, surely our common quest to obey Him is the indispensable harmony in it. With divine imperatives of love and faith, repentance and compassion, honesty and forgiveness, there is room in this choir for all who wish to be there. So, to me, not only is it important for us to sing, I am a child of God, but I believe that it's equally important for us to be able to look at other people and say, you are a child of God, and he has sent you here. He's given you an earthly home with parents kind and dear. So, I'll lead you, guide you, walk beside you, and help you find the way. I'll teach you all that you must do to live with him someday. And with that, I have an application challenge for you, an experiment. For one day, look around and for every person that you see or interact with, just quickly remind yourself, they are a beloved child of God. So I see my wife and my children and I say, they're beloved children of God. I see the students in my classes who open their scriptures and participate in my class and I say, they're beloved children of God. And then I see the student who disrupts my class or openly expresses their desire not to be there. They're a beloved child of God. I see my neighbors who have left the church or no longer attend, and I say, they're beloved children of God. I see on television those who disagree with my religious or political views. They're beloved children of God. Or the person who roots for the other team, or the enemies of our nation, or the homeless individual on the side of the road. And with each, I just whisper to myself, they are a beloved child of God. And therefore, I should never be afraid to invite all to come unto him. I really feel that if you do this little experiment, your day is going to go very differently than it would have otherwise. So please, remember that truth that Nephi wanted his people to understand. All are alike unto God. Well, because God loves all of his children so much, he's going to offer all of them, Jew, Gentile, and Lamanite, a second chance. And what is that second chance? See if you can figure it out by reading these following verses. 2 Nephi 25, 17. And the Lord will set his hand again the second time to restore his people from their lost and fallen state. Wherefore? He will proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder among the children of men. 2 Nephi 26.16 For those who shall be destroyed shall speak unto them out of the ground, and their speech shall be low out of the dust, and their voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit. For the Lord God will give unto him power, that he may whisper concerning them, even as it were out of the ground, and their speech shall whisper out of the dust. 
Second Nephi 27, 6. And it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book, and they shall be the words of them which have slumbered. Second Nephi 27, 26. Therefore I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, yea, a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise and learned shall perish, and the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. And Second Nephi 29, 1. But behold, there shall be many at that day when I shall proceed to do a marvelous work among them, that I may remember my covenants which I have made unto the children of men, that I may set my hand again the second time to recover my people, which are of the house of Israel. So what is the world's second chance? What is it that he's going to do to reach out his hand again the second time to recover his people? What is this marvelous work and a wonder? It's the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is God's evidence that he loves all people. Because who was the Book of Mormon written for? Remember the title page we talked about. It was written to the Lamanites, the Jews, and the Gentiles. All are alike unto God, and the Book of Mormon is for all. So now we can go back to Nephi's note card and fill in the blank. The Book of Mormon is the world's second chance. And for 2 Nephi chapter 27, I've got an assignment for you. Read through it and identify all the major events in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. See if you can find where it talks about Moroni delivering the plates to Joseph, uh, the translation of those plates, the visit to Professor Anton, and also the testimony of the three witnesses. Also, if you've ever wondered what's written in that sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, you're going to find the answer in this chapter. See if you can find that too. But if I were teaching, I would probably focus my attention more on this question. What can the Book of Mormon do for us? And you can approach this in two ways, depending on the age and maturity of your audience. You could either list the following references and ask your class members to find the blessings. Or you could approach it with this crossword puzzle, if you'd like. And you'll instruct your class to find the answers to the clues and then answer the question at the bottom and be prepared to share. So here are the answers. Number two across. The Book of Mormon restores knowledge of Jesus Christ. Three across. The Book of Mormon will bring this to people. It's joy. Four across. The spiritually blind will see the light the Book of Mormon brings. Number six across. The Book of Mormon will be of great worth to the people of the latter days. Number eight across, the Book of Mormon will prepare the earth for the millennium. And that's a little bit of a harder one because it doesn't actually use that word. But if you read that last section of Nephi's talk, that's how it ends, with the description of the millennium. So the Book of Mormon is going to help usher in the millennium. Number nine across, the Book of Mormon will make us delightsome if we follow its teachings. And then 10 across, the spiritually deaf will hear the words of the Book of Mormon. And now to the down clues. The Book of Mormon will help bring about the restoration of God's people, which it certainly did. The Lord didn't even organize his church until after the Book of Mormon had been translated. Five down, the Book of Mormon removes darkness. And then seven down, the Book of Mormon proves that God will always remember his promises. And the final question that I would want my students to answer, after looking at all these great things that the Book of Mormon can do for them, I'd ask, what has the Book of Mormon done for you? And then I'd let them share. And as you look at those things, it's really amazing what the Book of Mormon does for us. And actually, I have to take that back just a little bit. We need to be careful to not get so wrapped up in the Book of Mormon that we forget what it was written for. And when you stop and think about it, it's not really the Book of Mormon itself that is the world's second chance, right? The Book of Mormon doesn't save people. The Book of Mormon doesn't redeem. We don't worship the Book of Mormon. We've got to be careful not to admire the beautifully wrapped box so much that we forget the gift inside. The reason the Book of Mormon is so important to us is because of who it testifies of and who it points us to. So let's go all the way back to chapter 25, verse 18, 
to discover why the Book of Mormon will be such a powerful force for good in the last days. What is it? Wherefore he shall bring forth his words unto them, which words shall judge them at the last day. For they shall be given them for the purpose of convincing them of the true Messiah. The reason the Book of Mormon is so powerful is because of its witness of Jesus Christ. That's the subtitle, right? Another Testament of Jesus Christ, which is going to lead Nephi to conclude in chapter 26, and we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies, that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. And then in verse 29, and now behold, I say unto you that the right way is to believe in Christ and deny him not. And Christ is the Holy One of Israel. Wherefore, you must bow down before him and worship him with all your might, mind, and strength and your whole soul. And if you do this, ye shall in no wise be cast out. So there you have it. The Book of Mormon is going to convince us of the true Messiah and connect its readers with him. So some personal questions for you here. Do you talk of Christ? Is he a part of your conversations, both casual and formal? Does his name come up throughout your week or just on Sunday? Do you rejoice in Christ? Are you a gospel optimist? Are you able to maintain your joy in the face of trial and tragedy? Do you look forward with happiness to spiritual things like church and general conference and prayer? Do you preach of Christ? Do you take your responsibility to proclaim the gospel seriously? Do you look for opportunities to share your faith with other people? Do you prophesy of Christ? Remember from Revelation 19.10 that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Do you bear your testimony of Jesus? Does your life an example testify of him? And do you seek to strengthen that testimony? And do you write of Christ? Do you keep a journal of your experiences with him? And do you pass those things on to others and your posterity? Jesus Christ is the message and the purpose of the Book of Mormon. And I know that centering our lives on his word and his grace and his example and his sacrifice and his love is going to bring us joy and purpose and strength, not only now, but in the next life as well. I believe in Christ. So let's go talk about him and rejoice in him and preach of him and prophesy of him and write of him. The Book of Mormon connects us with him in a unique and powerful way. And before we move on, some of you might be wondering if I'm going to say anything about chapter 25, verse 23, and that oft quoted phrase that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. And that relationship between faith and works and grace. Well, I feel I covered that idea in depth back in my Romans 1 through 6 video. And if you'd like to hear my thoughts on that idea, click on the link up at the top of the video and go to timestamp 2240 and you'll hear my thoughts on that. Also, the best talk that I've ever heard on that particular verse comes from Professor Brad Wilcox. Uh, no relation, by the way. In his Education Week talk entitled, the atonement after all we can do. And I'd just rather point you to him rather than try to reinvent the wheel here. It's really good and I highly recommend it. And there's a link to that talk up at the top as well. And I'll also put links to both videos in the description below. And that beautiful message of the Book of Mormon's focus on Christ is the major theme of Nephi's talk. And you're going to see next week that he's going to continue that thought and teach us more specifically about the doctrine of Christ. But there's another huge section in there that we haven't talked about yet. Do you think that Satan is just going to sit idly by while the Book of Mormon and its message of Christ destroys his wonderful wickedness? Not on your life. He's going to counterattack. And that's what you're going to find in chapters 28 and 29. And I like to introduce this section with the following icebreaker. I like to begin with a magic trick. Now, I am a bit of an amateur magician, and so I've got a bunch of tricks that I can choose from, but, but you might not have that luxury. So let me suggest an easy trick that anybody can do without having to buy some expensive gimmick or, or spend forever practicing. It's called the Professor's Nightmare, and uh, let me demonstrate it for you. 
What I have here are three different sizes of rope. I've got a short rope, a medium sized rope, and a long rope. And we're going to stick those three ropes right up here in my hand like that. And then we'll take the short rope and put the other ends also at the top. Then the medium sized rope and the long rope. And then we're going to use a little magic here and pull on these three ends. And we're just going to stretch those ropes out. We're going to pull them until we get right like that. Flip it over and you can see all three ropes are the same size. Now if we use a little magic we can bring it right back and pop it back out and we've got a long rope, a short rope, a medium. Now for the explanation. It doesn't take a lot of practice or tricky moves. There's just one move that you need to practice. So you're going to take the first rope, the short rope, and put that first, then the medium, and then the long. Now the move is when you take the short end and bring it up to this point, you're just going to set it in your thumb, right like that, and just roll it. It's like you're just having them switch places. So now the long end is going to take the place of the short end. Then you finish off the trick with the medium and then the long, like that. And then you grab onto these three ends and just pull. Now what that does, as you can see, I'll show you that that is going to connect the short rope and the long rope to make them look like they're the same size. But you're going to mask that under your hand, like that. Now let me show you one more time how that looks. One, two, three. Short rope comes up here. You roll it. Switch that. Then the medium. Then the long. And then when you pull, something that I like to do that I think helps make the trick uh, go a little more smooth. When I get to this point, I just flip it over like that really quick and grab it in this hand and then keep that knot under cover of my hand right there. And then you can show them that it looks like three ropes that are the same size. And then to finish the trick, you can just pull the ropes apart and show once again that you've got the small, the short, and the long rope. And that's how you do the professor's nightmare. Now you can make this trick on your own with a, a piece of cord or thin rope. And you're going to cut it to three different lengths. One should be 11 inches or 28 centimeters for our international listeners. The second one should be 21 inches or 53 centimeters. And the third should be 31 inches, 79 centimeters. But after I've performed that trick, I usually ask them, did I really magically cause the ropes to stretch and change their size? And they should say no. And then you can admit to them, you're right, I didn't. I deceived you. I tricked you into thinking that I did. And you know what? If you mess up or they figure out how you did it, it's really no big deal. You can just say, well, that's great. You guys can't be deceived. That's a good thing. But whatever way it happens, I'd lead into the lesson like this. Well, who is the greatest magician of all time? The greatest deceiver ever? And the answer is Satan. Satan is the greatest magician. He is a master of illusion. He's very skilled in tricking people into believing certain things that just aren't true, or fooling them into doing things that are to his advantage, not theirs. Well, the scriptures are one of our best tools to not being deceived they reveal the greatest magician's tricks. And so when he tries them on you, you won't be fooled. And 2 Nephi chapter 28 is full of Satan's tricks. Your job is to try to find as many as you can and then try to think of an example of a way that that trick is still being used today. And then I just send my class members into the scriptures to find all that they can. And they're everywhere. It's not going to be too hard for them to find them. But here's a sampling of some of the ones that I see. Verses 3 through 4. For it shall come to pass in that day that the churches which are built up, and not unto the Lord, 
When the one shall say unto the other, Behold, I, I am the Lord's, and the other shall say, I, I am the Lord's. And thus shall every one say that hath built up churches, and not unto the Lord. And they shall contend one with another, and their priests shall contend one with another. And they shall teach with their learning, and deny the Holy Ghost, which giveth utterance. One of Satan's tricks is confusion. He's going to fill the world with so many contending voices that people won't even know what to believe. This is a trick that Joseph Smith was very familiar with and why I think his story resonates with so many people. It's estimated that there are about 4,200 different religions in the world. When it comes to religion or life philosophy, we live in a very contentious and confusing world. Verse 7, Yea, and there shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die and it shall be well with us. And that's the, uh, that's the hedonist philosophy that we talked about a few lessons ago. The purpose of life is the pursuit of pleasure. A more modern way of describing that philosophy is the more recently popular acronym uh, YOLO, or you only live once. Whatever feels good, do it. So drinking alcohol and doing drugs makes you feel good, so do it. Lust and sexual indulgence provides pleasure, so give in. Greed, gluttony, and partying are enjoyable, so yield to them. But it's a trick. Satan advertises the pleasure, but masks the hangover, the addiction, the aimlessness, the shallow and short-lived relationships, the diseases, and the negative impacts on family and children. Magicians are very good at masking or hiding certain things. Up their sleeves, under their hats, behind the handkerchief. They only show you exactly what they want you to see. It's exactly what Satan does. Verse 8, And there shall also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, take the advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor, there's no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we're guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes. And at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. This philosophy is a slight variation of the last. This one basically says, I want to be good, but not that good. I've actually heard students say that phrase. It's the lie that God doesn't, it's the lie that God doesn't expect much from his children. It's discipleship with no vision, no commitment to improvement, and uh, a propensity for rationalizing away sin. It's the no big deal attitude. And this, this is a much more subtle and tricky deception of the devil than the first one. And I feel that there are members of the church who have been fooled by this one. Now, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have people that feel that they'll never measure up and that God isn't merciful and that causes them to be discouraged and want to give up. And that trick works too. Satan doesn't really care how he makes you miserable. He'll use either side and usually operates on the extremes. Now, there's a theme to this next trick over the next eight verses or so, and it's one of the big ones, one of Satan's finest tricks. It's, uh, it's his showstopper. Can you see what it is? What idea is repeated over and over in this section? Verses 9 through 15. Yea, and there shall be many which shall teach after this manner, false and vain and foolish doctrines, and shall be puffed up in their hearts, and shall seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord, and their works shall be in the dark. And the blood of the saints shall cry from the ground against them. Yea, they have all gone out of the way, they have become corrupted. Because of pride, and because of false teachers and false doctrines, their churches have become corrupted, and their churches are lifted up. Because of pride, they are puffed up. They rob the poor because of their fine sanctuaries. They rob the poor because of their fine clothing. And they persecute the meek and the poor in heart, because in their pride they're puffed up. They wear stiff necks and high heads. Yea, and because of pride and wickedness and abominations and whoredoms, they have all gone astray, save it be a few, who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led, that in many instances they do err, because they are taught by the precepts of men. O oh, the wise, and the learned, and the rich, that are puffed up in the pride of their hearts, and all those who preach false doctrines, and all those who commit whoredoms, and pervert the right way of the Lord. Woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty. 
for they shall be thrust down to hell. Did you catch a theme there? It's pride, right? They're puffed up. And I think there's a reason why he spends so many verses on this one. This trick is so effective that almost all of us are fooled by it now and then. In magic, one of the most delightful types of tricks to perform is to lead the spectator into a false sense of security and confidence, to make them feel like they have you, to fake that you've messed up or that they figured out the gimmick, only to spring it back on them at the last moment and pull the rug out from under them, so to speak. I think that that's what it's going to be like for a lot of people with Satan. They feel prideful, confident, in control, when really Satan had them in the palm of his hand all along. Now, the Book of Mormon has a lot to say about pride, so I know that we're going to deal with it on a much deeper level in the future. But one quick point. God has made us all different. No two people on this earth are the same. That is a glorious truth. And what our Heavenly Father wants for us is to recognize those differences and appreciate them. To say, you're different than I am. You have different strengths and talents and gifts than I do. Isn't that great? Let's celebrate those differences. Satan, on the other hand, wants us to say, you're different than I am. And my way of being different is better than your way of being different. Any differences between us and others is an invitation to pride. Or if somebody has more of something than another, it's really difficult for us not to come to the conclusion that we're better. And these verses seem to suggest that there are three major areas that seem to particularly tempt people to pride. Riches, outward appearance, and learnedness. I'm richer than you, I'm better looking than you, or I'm smarter than you. We've just got to learn to not come to the conclusion that because we have more than somebody else, that we are better than somebody else. Verse 20, For behold, at that day shall he rage in the hearts of the children of men, and stir them up to anger against that which is good. Anger is a powerful trick of the devil. There's a lot of anger out there directed at the church and the gospel. I'm often shocked at how worked up people get about those of us that, that live our religion. Sometimes I've even had to delete some of the comments on this channel because of that kind of thing. People that are offended, upset, and just downright irritated with faith and belief. It makes me wonder why they don't have better things to do with their time. And it's not just anger at religion. Just anger in general. I see it everywhere. Online, on the news. People are angry at this and angry at that. Our political discourse is full of anger. Social media is full of anger. And I appreciate this quote from Mark Twain. Anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. Verse 21, And others will he pacify, and lull them away into carnal security, that they will say, All is well in Zion, yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls, and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. And this, this is such a fascinating one. This one is directed mainly at members of the church. Satan will pacify and lull people into security. He's going to cheat them and lead them carefully down to hell. Cheat and carefully are good magician words. You can't be too brazen in magic. You, you've got to be extremely careful and measured in your deception. And what's the trick here? Casualness and complacency. Sometimes we get complacent in our Sunday worship or our dedication to our callings, our language, our media choices, our scripture study. He says that Satan is going to pacify us and lull us away into carnal security. Uh, one of the greatest inventions ever created for parents is a small object called a pacifier. And when my infants were upset or fussy, I'd give them a pacifier and lo and behold, they'd go to sleep. Or I'd sing them a lull, a bye. And again, that would help them to fall asleep. Apparently, that's what Satan wants us to do. He wants to put us to sleep, spiritually. And once he has us asleep, it's so much easier to manipulate us and to trick us. So much easier to, to wrap us up in his chains. And you all know this. When you were at scout camp or girls camp, when was the best time to play pranks on people? When they were asleep. That's when we're at our most vulnerable. 
And that descent into sleep is usually slow and imperceptible. Don't let Satan put you to sleep. Stay vigilant. Stay watchful. Stay awake. Verse 22. And behold, others he flattereth away, and telleth them there is no hell. And he saith unto them, I am no devil, for there is none. And thus he whispereth in their ears, until he grasps them with his awful chains, from whence there is no deliverance. Another trick of Satan is to tell people that he doesn't exist. Which seems pretty strange, considering that Satan is so self-centered and proud. However, it's actually really diabolically clever. If there's no devil or hell, that means that there are no eternal consequences to our decisions, no right or wrong, no future judgment uh, or accounting for our behavior. One of the techniques of magic is to tell people you aren't doing something at the exact moment that you're doing it. It's amazing how effective that can be in deflecting attention away from the trick that you're trying to perform. Sometimes I'll begin a magic trick by presenting an object and saying, here's an ordinary deck of cards or an ordinary coin or an ordinary pencil, when I know full well that those objects are anything but ordinary. Satan does the same thing. He totally denies what is plainly true. Well, you can see, Satan is a great magician with a whole lot of tricks up his sleeve. But now that you know what to look for, you shouldn't be fooled. A number of years ago, there was a television show called Magic's Greatest Secrets Finally Revealed. And it was put on by a masked magician who was afraid of the backlash that he'd get from the magic community for revealing their secrets. Which is exactly what happened. Magicians were angry. Their craft was being destroyed. Well, I like to hold up my scriptures and say, Satan's greatest secrets finally revealed. Or hold up a conference edition of the Enzyme and say, Satan's greatest secrets finally revealed. If we can just go to the scriptures and the prophets, we're going to make him angry. Nothing makes Satan more angry than the scriptures and the prophets because they reveal his tricks. So please don't be fooled. Satan is a phony, a charlatan, a cheat. Keep your eyes on the scriptures and the brethren. And the next time Satan tries one of these tricks on you, you can look back at him with a smug look on your face and say, I know how you do it. You're not going to fool me. That trick may have worked on Laman and Lemuel, but it's not going to work on me. You might have gotten away with that with King Noah, but I'm smarter than that. Judas Iscariot was tricked by that one, but I already know the secret. I'm not going to be fooled by you. One final thought here. One of Satan's biggest attacks against the Book of Mormon and its power is going to be a direct attack on its legitimacy in the last days. And that attack is described in chapter 29. What are people going to say? And because my words shall hiss forth, many of the Gentiles shall say, A Bible, a Bible, we've got a Bible, and there cannot be any more Bible. And maybe you've heard that argument before. I know I have, especially on my mission. The Bible's all there is. The Bible's all we need. The Book of Mormon can't be true. And I want you to imagine something. Imagine you're sitting on a bus and you strike up a conversation with the person sitting next to you and the fact that you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ comes up. And they look at you and say, why do I need the Book of Mormon? Isn't the Bible enough? How would you respond to that? And maybe you could pause the video and, and think about an answer. And did you struggle? If you did, I feel that 29 verses 7 through 11 has some great responses to that charge. And what are they? One, God remembers all nations. Why would God only speak to one people? Doesn't he love everybody equally? And if you look closely at a map of the world, there are really two separate connected land masses, the old world and the new world. And doesn't it make sense that God would give those in the new world a chance to know him and hear his words and be taught his gospel? God remembers all nations and all people. And the second reason, Wherefore murmur ye, because that ye shall receive more of my word? Are we upset to receive more of God's word? I really wonder about that one. Why are people so averse to receiving more of our Heavenly Father's truth? I find it hard to believe that all God would do for us is send the Bible and then say, You figure it out on your own, and then turn and walk away. 
It's obvious that the Bible all by itself has not been enough to clarify God's truth. There's so many different ways to interpret the Bible. I can quote you one verse and say, see, this is the truth. But then you can pull out a different Bible verse and say, no, no, you're wrong. See, the Bible says this. In fact, two people can be looking at the exact same verse and come up with two completely different meanings for it. What's an honest seeker of the truth to do? Well, with the Book of Mormon, with two witnesses, we can rest assured what the proper interpretation is. And the Book of Mormon will lead us to his church, which can teach us the fullness of the gospel message through his living prophets. It makes so much sense to me that Heavenly Father would give us more of his word. I don't know why they complain about it. And then reason number three, God is the same forever. If God spoke to living prophets in the past, what makes us think that he'd stop doing that now? Why would that major means of communication change after the early apostles died? Why wouldn't he speak to prophets and individuals on the other side of the world too? And why wouldn't he do that today? So the next time somebody asks you why we need the Book of Mormon instead of just the Bible, maybe you'll know what to say. And that is all I have for you this week, my friends. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please share it with somebody else. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.